You know, we here at Grace Bible Church unapologetically believe and confess that all of God's word, all of it from beginning to end, is equally inspired, equally inerrant, equally sufficient, equally given to us by God as his perfect revelation to us. There is no passage of scripture more inspired than another. There is no passage of scripture less inspired than another. But with that said, within the totality of God's word, there are some passages that are just uniquely foundational, aren't they? Uniquely influential, uniquely memorable for so many of God's people. Perhaps several passages come to your mind. Passages like Jeremiah 29.11 and Philippians 4.13. Passages memorized by almost everyone and used even by non-Christians for some reason, interestingly. So, passages like Proverbs 3.5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. John 1.1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus' final great commission to his disciples at the end of the book of Matthew. And then, of course, you have the most famous of them all. And what is that? John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. All of those are influential, they're impactful, they're uniquely foundational in our lives, and for good reasons. Perhaps you have others that come to your mind. Well, this morning we are going to come to one of those passages, one of those foundational verses that I would guess many of you have memorized. And for those of you who don't have it memorized, I'm certain that you'll be very familiar with it when I read it. That verse is Romans 5 verse 8, a verse that one author called the John 3.16 of the book of Romans. The verse says this, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's a beautiful, life-giving, foundational verse. It's a verse that takes us back to the very heart of the gospel. It takes us back to the very root of what Christ has done for us. As we're making our way through the book of Romans, we're coming now to the end of our third section. That third section in our outline that we have titled Reconciliation to God. We've seen in this whole section that Paul is laying out for us those foundational truths of what it means that we are justified by faith alone. And he's detailing for us what God in his sovereign mercy has chosen to do for us to reconcile us with God. Christ. This passage of chapter 5, really verse 1 through 11, is a, is a unit together, but we split them up because there's so much contained in these 11 verses. Last week, Steve walked through those first five verses of chapter 5, and for those of you who were here, you'll remember he showed you five fantastic benefits of your salvation. To remind you what those were, you have perfect peace. You have a profound position. You have a precious prospect. You have a productive process, and you have the personal person of the Holy Spirit. We saw at the end of that passage in verse 5, Paul mentions God's love being poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Well, now this morning, as we move into the second half of this larger section in verse 6, we're going to see Paul now camp out a little bit on what it means, what that love of God that's been poured into our hearts, what that love actually looks like and how that, has, that love has been shown to us. So let me start by reading. I want to read the full passage just to refresh your memory and get the context here. Let's start in verse 1. I'm going to read through verse 11, and then we're really going to hone in and camp out on verses 6 through 11 this morning. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance. 
and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. One author summarized it well when he said, that Romans 5, 6 through 11 is really just a commentary on verse 5. And that's exactly what this passage, passage is. This passage we're going to be in this morning is really just a commentary. It's camping out, ex- explaining a little more what exactly that love of God that's been poured out upon our hearts actually looks like. And we're going to see as we walk through these verses that this love that he has demonstrated to us is undeserving, It's unexpected, it's unending, and it's uplifting. That's going to be our our outline this morning as we walk through this passage. So let's walk through those one at a time. First, we see Paul point us to the truth that God's love is undeserved. Look again how he begins in verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Remember, Paul is writing here, in this letter to Christians in Rome. Now you'll remember for that almost two full chapters, in chapters two and three, Paul made the case that all people, Gentiles and Jews alike, are equally sinful, equally dead in their sin, equally stand justly accused before a holy and righteous God. But it would be easy for some, perhaps, of God's people to look around at the unconverted world and think, yeah, yeah, that's right, Paul. I know that's true of them. I know that's true of them and their sin. I know that's true of them, those heathen sinners. But Paul is reminding them here in this first verse in verse 6 that this was true of them as well. It's not true now, per se, but it once was true of them as well. He's reminding them the same thing in the same way that he reminded the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. One of my favorite passages. If you remember that passage, Paul reminds the Corinthians the seriousness of sin and the penalty for all manner of sin. He he writes this in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he lists just a litany of sins. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. None of these, Paul says, will inherit the kingdom of God. And you can imagine those self-righteous people hearing that list and thinking to themselves, that's right, Paul, you get them, right? Get all of those heathen sinners. But then he drops the hammer in verse 11 and writes this, probably my favorite sentence in all of Scripture, and such were some of you. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. You see, just like the most heathen convert in the world, whether you were basically good and morally upright, or maybe you were a complete godless heathen, or anywhere in between, it was while you were still weak that Christ died for you. It was while you were such were some of these that Christ called you to himself and reconciled you with the Father. What does that word weak here really mean? It's a word that I think is a lot worse than our English translation weak. When we read that while we were still weak, that doesn't really give the word justice in the English that it's referring to in the Greek. In the Greek, it's a word that literally means helpless. Helpless. 
totally powerless, feeble, frail, completely unable to do anything or earn any acceptance with God. Helpless, I think, would perhaps be a better translation of that word. We were helpless to escape the wrath of God. We were helpless to escape hell. We were helpless to overcome our sin and our judgment before God. We were helpless to earn the righteousness required to stand before a holy God. We were helpless in all of this. And it was while we were in that state, while we were in that state of helplessness, that Christ died for us. At the right time, he says there in verse 6. Now, there are, there are two different Greek words that are used for time. One is a word that's used to resper, refer to a specific time, like it is 11.18 a.m. on a Sunday right now. The word that Paul uses here for time is not that kind of time. Rather, the word he uses here is a different Greek word. It's a word that refers to a strategic opportune moment within time. So not a specific time, but an era, a time in general. Paul is referring here in this verse to that time that is ripe and the exact moment that God had designated for Jesus to come on his mission-saving mission uh, that he had before the foundation of the world. It's that exact same idea as Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Paul's reminding us here, God had set the stage. In his perfect plan, the time was right. The time that he had planned before the foundation of the world, before the creation of anything, he planned at that moment when Jesus came for the world, for the countries, for the politics, for everything to look exactly like it looked in that moment of time to be the moment that he set forth his son for the mission that he had been destined for from the very beginning. And what was that mission? Well, look at verse 6. For while we were still weak or help us at the right time, now here's the mission, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died. That was his mission. He came to die. Jesus, it, it was not enough for Jesus to come to this earth and to teach great parables or to lead an exemplary, perfect life, both of which he did. It wasn't enough for Jesus to come to this earth and to be a great rabbi, to have a devoted following. It wasn't even enough for him to simply shed blood. It wasn't enough for him to shed the blood that he did in the garden or to shed the blood that he did when he was circumcised as a baby. No, he had to shed blood by dying. Because as Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. If he were going to come in this mission set forth before the foundation of the world to fully and finally and satisfactor, satisfactorily pay for the sins of his people and accomplish the mission set forth from the Father, he had to die as a substitute. And that's exactly what he did. He died as a substitute and an unequal one at that. The just died for the unjust. The perfectly godly died for the ungodly. The one who was perfectly holy died on behalf and for the benefit of those who were unholy. That's what that word ungodly means here at the end of verse 6. We were irreverent. We were impious without giving the due reverence to God. To the very depth of our core, to the very depths of inside of us, we were ungodly. We were wicked. We did not revere God. We did not want God. And we did not give glory to God. That's what Paul is reminding us of here. And do you know how much dead, lifeless, ungodly, weak, helpless people can do to make their way to God on their own? Absolutely none. Absolutely zero. I love how the Second London Baptist Confession from 1689 makes this point when it speaks of so-called free will. It writes this, quote, humanity by falling into a state of sin has completely lost all ability to choose any spiritual good that accomplishes salvation. 
Thus, in their natural state, they are absolutely opposed to spiritual good and dead in sin so that they cannot convert themselves by their own strength or prepare themselves for conversion. Now, we'll cover this in much, much, much more detail in the months to come as we make our way through Romans chapter 8 and chapter 9 especially. But the point is here in seed form. God's love is completely undeserved, not least of which because it has been shown to and lavished upon such dead, worthless, ungodly human beings such as you and I. But as this love is shown forth to us, it is not something that any of us in our natural dead state wanted. Not something we sought out. Remember Romans 3, no one seeks good God. No one does good. No one wants God. And yet God, in his sovereign, lavish mercy, has chosen to display that love upon us at the right time, dying for the ungodly. This love that God demonstrates is undeserved. Secondly, it is unexpected. Look at verses 7 and 8. Paul's going to compare here the unexpected love that we see God show with the sort of human-level love that we're used to seeing. He writes there in verse 7, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. Paul's right there before we read verse 8 again. What what Paul's going to do here in verses 7 and 8, he's making the argument from the lesser to the greater. He, He begins with the lesser, the sort of human love that you and I are used to being, seeing be on display. Paul's declaring what we know to be true in our own experience. It is not common that one human will choose to die for another human being, though occasionally, he says, that can happen, but only if it's for a good person. You and I can think of stories of, of mothers or fathers giving their lives for their, to save their children. Or perhaps you think about the story of the Titanic or other noble stories, great stories where noble men give their place on the lifeboat for the sake of women and children. Paul's saying that doesn't always happen. It doesn't even necessarily often happen, but it does happen. And, and we're familiar in some degree with that sort of love. But what you don't see is a line of people lining up to try to give their life for some low-life heathen, right? You don't see that. But that is the exact sort of love that we see God showing us in Christ. And that is the point that Paul's making in these verses. That's the contrast he now draws in verse 8. Verse 7, one will scarcely die for a righteous person. That does happen. Verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Martin Lloyd-Jones is famous for saying that we praise God for the buts in the Bible. You think about the most famous but in the Bible, but God in Ephesians 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. That's the very same love that we're talking about now. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, you hear the same language, right? Made us alive together with God. Christ. That's the exact same sort of contrast that Paul is drawing for us now. God's love is so different from ours. God's love is so unique compared to ours. God's love is not only completely undeserved, it is entirely unexpected. Who would have dreamt that a perfectly righteous and holy God would show us his love while sinners? while rebellious, while ungodly, while all of that was true of us, he would choose to send his son to die for us. And one author summarizes it well when he writes this, the amazing character of God's love thus lies in the fact that it was exercised towards those whose natural condition was absolutely repugnant to his holiness. That's the sort of love that God shows us. That's the unexpected, unhuman-like love that God lavishes upon us. It's undeserved love. It is unexpected love. And thirdly, it is an unending love. God's love is unending. 
Look with me again at verse 9. Since, therefore, in light of that truth, since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. We're reminded in these verses of the three verb tenses that we should associate with our salvation. We see this throughout God's word. We see a past salvation, a present salvation, and a future salvation. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. It's justification, sanctification, glorification. You and I have been saved, past tense, from the penalty of sin. You and I are being saved, present tense, from the power and the practice of sin. And we, one day, future tense, will be saved from the presence of sin. You see, our salvation bought and secured for us by Jesus is a comprehensive salvation. It's a package deal. It's all in one salvation from start to finish. Paul is reminding us here in Romans 5 the same reality that he points us to in Philippians 1.6. I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, past tense, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice just a few things in these verses. Notice first what it is that Paul says you and I will be saved from in the future. We will be saved from the wrath of God. You know, it's amazing how little God's wrath is talked about in self-proclaimed evangelical churches today. And in contrast, how often it's talked about in God's word. You know, there's very many people who will get riled up when you talk about this subject. I read one pastor recently mention how he posted on Twitter this simple, true, biblical, we believe, statement. Quote, hell is a real place populated with real people suffering real pain under real wrath. That was it. That was the quote. In response to that tweet, which again, you and I, I w- we would fully agree is summarizing biblical teaching on this topic. In response to that tweet, this pastor talked about the shocking number, not just of non-Christians who you would expect to recoil against such a statement, but the shocking number of pro- professing evangelical Christians who were outraged at such a statement and acknowledgement of the reality of hell. Listen, brothers and sisters, hell is not a topic that we revel in. The wrath of God is not something that makes us giddy to think about and talk about. But we should never let the reactions or potential reactions of those who disregard the Bible's teaching on this subject to sway our profession or our proclamation of the Bible's teaching. The fact is, we see from beginning to end in God's word, God is holy, we are sinners, and the only response of a holy God to sinful rebellion is wrath. Conscious, unending, forever wrath against those who have rebelled against him and refuse to receive the free gift of salvation offered through Christ. That leads to the second observation here in this passage. Notice how Paul refers to us in our natural human condition in verse 10. He refers to us now in verse 10 as enemies. Notice the progressive picture that he's painting throughout this passage of the natural man. It's not a very pretty one, is it? Verse 6, ungodly. Verse 8, sinners. And now verse 10, enemies. This word enemies is a strong term. It points us to the fact that sin has put us completely in the wrong with God. An enemy is not someone that simply comes up a little bit short of being a friend. An enemy means you are someone that is in the complete opposite camp. That sinners are God's enemies is something that's stated a number of times throughout the New Testament. I'm just going to give you a few references. You can look them up on your own if you'd like. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul writes of the many who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Colossians 1, verse 21, very similar to this passage, referring to the Colossian believers in their past state, 
He writes, you who once were alienated, same thing, same root word, referring to enemies. You who once were enemies and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. And James 4.4 4 speaks of those who are friends with the world are at enmity with God. The point is this, outside of Christ, in your natural state, as a sinner, as the ungodly, both of which characterize every single person that hasn't placed their faith in Jesus, outside of Christ, you are an enemy of God. There is no neutral position. You are either a friend of God by virtue of the salvation bought and secured for you by Christ, or you are an enemy of God. Or to put it perhaps more starkly, you are either, as John says in 1 John 3, a child of God, or you are a child of Satan. 1 John 3.10, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. There is no third category in scripture. There is no neutral position. Even if you grew up in a Bible-believing church, had Christian parents, you've been to church your whole life, you've gone through all the right motions, you're the most religious, by-the-book, rule-follower you can think of, if you are not born again through a living and active faith in the finished work of Jesus on your behalf, you are a card-carrying enemy of the God of the universe. You have committed an act of divine treason, and there is no way of rectifying your, salva- your situation on your own. There is no way for you on your own to declare a peace treaty with God on your own merits. The only way for you to move from enmity with God to having peace with God is by faith in Jesus. And that leads to our third point to notice in these verses. Notice that our justification is said to be by his blood. We've seen many things that our justification is said to be by or to be associated with in the book of Romans throughout the New Testament. We see that justification is by grace in verse 24 of chapter 3. It is by faith, chapter 3, verse 28. It's connected with the resurrection at the end of chapter 4. We see in 1 Corinthians 6 that justification is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit. Galatians 2, our justification is in Christ. And now here in Romans 5, our justification is by his blood. These are all facets referring to the same great act of God. It's just various ways of expressing and centering the the truth of what is at the center of our justification. The good news in all of these descriptions is that our enmity with God is not the last word. In his kindness and his goodness and his lavish mercy, God sent his son to make a way for our salvation. Through the work of Christ, we are, verse 10, justified by his blood. We are reconciled to God by the death of his son. Notice the mention of the death of Jesus in both of these descriptions. We've mentioned it already, but I think it's worth doubling down and mentioning again, the death of Jesus was necessary for our salvation. God in his perfect holiness, in his perfect justice, God simply could not snap his fingers and have it all taken care of. God's too holy for that. God is too just for that. The demands of his holy righteousness, the demands of his holy character were that righteousness had to be met, justice had to be satisfied. And there's nothing that a single one of us could do. Someone else had to do that in our place. And that someone else was the Lord Jesus. That's why he came to this earth. That's why he was clothed with our humanity. That's why he had to live a perfect life. And that's why he had to suffer that agonizing death. Suffering not only the physical sufferings of the cross, but much more importantly, suffering the spiritual suffering, bearing the wrath of God in our place. That's what it means that our justification was by his blood. And finally, notice that our salvation past guarantees our salvation future. Again, in these verses, Paul is moving from the lesser to the greater. Uh, To summarize his argument, he's saying this. Listen, if God was able to reconcile you and save you while you were his enemy... What in the world would make us think that he couldn't keep us reconciled now that we're his friends, keep us to the end? The fact is he can. The fact is he 
will. The fact is, we can have a rock-solid confidence that he will lose none of those that are his. Verses 1 and 2 could leave someone asking the question, okay, I know I have peace with God. I know I have friendship with God now. But when I get, and I know that I will when I get to heaven and I have glory with, with God, but how do I know that I'll make it there? How do I know that I will endure from the present moment to the end of time? Well, here in verses 9 and 10, Paul gives us that answer. Here he assures us that Christ's work for our salvation not only gives us hope for our ultimate future, but also for our immediate future. We are assured here that we will be persevered as saved throughout our life to the very day of judgment. He assures us of this by making two points. First, he says, if Jesus stayed on the cross and saved us while we were his enemies, how much more will he be able to keep us saved now that we are his friends? And secondly, if Jesus achieved our salvation in his death, how much more will he keep us saved now that he's alive? Look at in the end of verse 10. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Now, Paul is later going to address the issue of so-called losing your salvation later in this letter, and we will address that topic in full when we come to those passages. But here, he answers the question indirectly. It's as Tim Keller puts it, quote, he says it's inconceivable that Christ should fail to save us to the end. The God who brought us into faith will keep us going in our faith. The God who opened heaven to us will ensure that we actually arrive there. So you see, God's love, as we have seen here in verses 6 through 10, is undeserved. It's a love that's unexpected. It's a love that is unending. Now, how should all of these truths affect us as believers, as those who have experienced this undeserved, unexpected, unending love? How should that affect us and move us? Well, that leads to our final verse and our final you for our outline. God's love is uplifting. I don't know if that word fits. It's the best you word I could think of, but I hope you'll get the point. Verse 11, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In one word, our response to that sort of love shown to us should be joy. We're to be those who rejoice in God. Every blessing that you and I have as a Christian comes from Christ. Just listen to this list of things that we've experienced in Christ just from this one passage of Scripture in verses 1 through 11. Through him we have peace with God. We have grace and the hope of glory. We have endurance, character, and hope. We have God's love poured into our hearts. We have deliverance from sin by his atoning death. We have deliverance from the wrath of God, reconciliation with the Father, and per- preservation during this present life. In light of of all of these spiritual blessings, what other response could you and I have than sheer joy in God? Delight in God, not only for what he has done for us, but much more importantly, for who he is for us. One author puts it like this. He says that we should be singing the hallelujah chorus and walking on the sunny side of hallelujah avenue about all of these truths. You see, the fact is there should be no stoic, emotionless, cold-hearted Christians. Now, that certainly doesn't mean that we're all happy, clappy Christians all the time, right? Or it doesn't mean that all of our joy is necessarily expressed in the same way. God has created different personalities and different temperaments and different wirings. Joy in one person may look completely different from joy in someone else, and that's perfectly okay. We should embrace those differences. But the fact remains, we have received a gift of immeasurable price. We have received by grace through faith reconciliation with the holy, just God of the universe. And we look forward to a future, an eternity with him in glory. In light of all that, may we come this morning to the Lord's table with a fresh joy in God, with a fresh rejoicing of these truths,
May we come to that final song that we'll sing in a few moments and sing together with a renewed rejoicing. Again, maybe expressed in different ways by different people, but it should swell joy in all of us as we think about all that God has done for us in Christ. I pray that we would let these precious truths of God's love here in this passage be the joy-inducing, joy-filling truths that they are. I want to close before I pray with a wonderful quote by John Stott, and then I'll pray as we prepare to come to the Lord's table. Stott wrote this, We should be the most positive people in the, in the world. We cannot mooch around the place with a drooping hangdog expression. We cannot drag our way through life moaning and groaning. We cannot always be looking on the dark side of everything as negative prophets of doom. No, we exult in God. Then every part of our life becomes suffused with glory. Christian worship becomes a joyful celebration of God and Christian living a joyful service of God. So come, Stott writes, let us exult in God together. That's my same prayer this morning. Come now as we come to the Lord's table. Let us exult, let us rejoice in God together for all that God has done for us in Christ. Let's go to him now in prayer.